Hi everyone, I hope you're well. Please say hello in the comments. Here we are again, live stream number 20. So, as per usual, we're trying to cover a ludicrously large amount in this short period of time, so I'll crack straight on. Please say hello in the comments so I can introduce you. Aditya, how are you doing? Thanks for coming. Um, so we're doing a lot today. Let's do a quick, um, a quick recap, a bit of a quiz time rewind, and let's think about what, uh, where we were last time. We did some sorting and some searching last time. So who can remember Jumbo Lizard? How are you, dear boy? Thanks for coming. Great to great to have you here. What about this one? Any ideas? What four values will appear in the yellow boxes below? What do we think? How many have we got? We've got uh, we've got nine so far, I think, on the here. So well done for coming. Number twenty. Twenty times we've done this. Ooh, did just come in with two, four, five, six, and that was from last week. I'm going to zip through these quite quickly. Uh, and it was actually two, four, five, six, two, four, five, six. So that is outstanding. Um, good. So let's go on to the next one again. This one was one we looked at last week. Look at the diagram below. How many iterations would it take a binary search algorithm to find the value 19? Any idea? What do we think? We looked at binary searches and we looked at, uh, and we looked at a couple of sorts of um, Again, very likely to pitch up in some form. They'll try to make you rearrange words. And I think understanding the search of the sorts is one thing that you think about how to show it on the page. So there will be some practice on that, but that's uh, the thing I'm sort of thing. They occasionally give you a grid to fill out, which is slightly easier, but there's sometimes you need to do it in the same time. What would a bubble, a, a bubble sort look like? And there's music playing. Thanks for that. Don't actually know where that music's coming from. Has it has it vanished now? I've got rid of it. Obviously, I've got to turn off all the sound here, or else you get the most disgusting echo. It's that or wearing headphones, which I find quite quite unpleasant. So, is that all quiet now? I hope so. What about this one? Any idea? I'm going to zip through it. I'm going to zip through it anyway. Uh, so, what about this one? The answer was three. Here's the next one. Brilliant. Sorry about that. Yeah, it was playing some music that I actually was unaware that was going on. Hmm. I don't know what it was. So who have we got? Uh, good. I'm glad we solved that. Yeah, do let me know if the, if the sound's weird. Because I, I have to look on the screen to see if the... Um, hi, Bogdan. How are you doing? To see if, the, uh, if things are a bit strange. So what about this? Um, what type of search algorithm could be carried out on this data in its current form? And they love this question. Yeah, they love this question, don't they? And do you know what? That's exactly... No, it's a linear search for this one. Why is it a linear search? That's the question you need to ask yourself, okay? Why is it that one? And it's the cool, because the answer is, is that it's, it's whether the data is organised or not. I'm kind of rushing, because I'm aware that I'm going to try and teach several weeks' worth of material in about 10 minutes. So, um, you, sir, are a genius, and that is the answer. So that's what they love to, they love to try to get you to say, is that the binary search must be in order, and they can find weird and wonderful ways of done, doing that. So, well done, Bogdan, that's brilliant. Um, uh, nice to see you. Thanks for coming, man, like Paul. I sound quieter than usual, do I? Okay. Let's try and figure out why that's the case. Oh, I can see I do. Okay, hang on. I'm going to change some things here. Oh, I know what I've done. Right, hang on. Is that any better now? I'm turning those down. I'm turning this one up here. Oh, I can see. Yeah, there we go. So, sound. Is that is that good now? Okay. Are we there now, guys? That's going to be really loud, isn't it? I can see that. Okay, I can see I've got a decent sound level now. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Yeah, a bit rushing around to get home and get this sorted out. Awesome. Okay, so what about this one? Company, thousands of customers. Um, cool. I'm glad that is working. Thanks, guys, for keeping me honest. Uh, so what do we think? What do we think about this one? Company, thousands of customer entries in its computer system. Each customer has a 10-digit ID number, which the company uses to sort the list of customers. When a new customer signs uh, up, their details are added to the end of the sorted list. Which algorithm 
would best could you best use to make sure the list remains sorted any ideas on that guys any ideas what do my assembled geniuses think of this one again this is a scenario based one so they that they'll try all these different ways of getting out of you do you understand what to use so we've got the insertion sort from Aditya we've got the insertion sort from Bogdan I'm going to rush you I'm going to rush through this and get on to the next one and the answer is of course the insertion sort and that is outstanding right um, this one if a computer has a low amount of memory and again this, these are all the advantages and disadvantages of the various different searches and sorts that we looked at but you need a large number of items you would probably avoid which algorithm? Question mark. You would avoid the merge, says Aditya. Should we see if he's correct? I know I'm rushing you slightly, but uh, it has to be done. And the answer is, dun, 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 it is merge sort. Guys, outstanding. I think we have got that. Now, I'm going to try and cover quite a lot today. I've got one more of these. This diagram shows the passes of an incomplete sort. Hash Brown, you are absolutely spot on. I know I'm legging it through this. This diagram shows the passes of an incomplete sort. What type of algorithm is being used? What do we think? Question mark. Oh, Aditya's coming with bubble sort. Any more takers before I move on? I'm six minutes in. I'm aware that I need to push on with this. Bubble sort, bubble sort, should we see? The answer's bubble sort. I'm sure the others are coming through. Yep. Bubble sort, bubble sort, bubble sort. Right, let's crack on with this. What's it all about today? Well, we've bitten off quite a lot um, in, today's, uh, in today's live stream. So we're going to look at data types, integer, and I think this should be quite straightforward. The first bit I'm going to push through because I know that you guys understand this stuff. And then we're going to look at the, the programming techniques, the one that probably we need to spend a bit more time on, certainly over the time before the exam. OK, so um, this is when they will ask you to write a bit of code and to try to get you to use uh, to use commands like open, read, write and close files, which in themselves aren't hard, but it will be helpful for you to see them in context so you know what you need to do. We'll do a bit of SQL, look at arrays. Um, sub-programs and a random number generator all of that in 23 minutes which is madness but actually it can be done so let's get on with it so first of all data types you have data data can be in different formats you've got boolean which is true or false yes or no one or zero you've got string which is one or more alphanumeric characters for example hello and typically you wouldn't be doing sort of arithmetic calculations on a string you can do calculations on a string to find the third letter or the fourth letter or the last letter or the first letter or the third letter from the right or the second letter from the left you can do those sorts of calculations we'll look at those later but obviously you can't do maths true maths on a on a on a character okay oh, sorry on a string or which leads us on to a character which is a single alphanumeric character now this really is just a recap because this is mainly common sense isn't it and then you've got the difference between a float or a real number um, and an integer and a float's got a decimal point and an integer doesn't it's a whole number I know you've done this to death in maths but uh, again this is something that they might try and ask you about in the sort of one or two markers early on the sort of easier questions data types done and dusted right we've got the common operators here um, and again we've done a lot of these clearly you need to understand the difference between the double equals and the equals because the double equals is when you're going to compare two sides of an argument to say when this is the same as this whereas the equals is for assigning that's when you assign an operator when you sorry when you create a variable when you assign one okay the greater than the less than don't forget which way around they are the not equal to the and the or the not we've done that's all the boolean logic stuff there and then I suppose the only one that can cause any confusion is the mod and the div. OK, the div is how many whole times the number will go into it. So uh, 9 div 3 would be 3 because it goes in three times. And the modulus is the remainder, OK, what's left over after the division or whatever has taken place. OK, so you can do all of those. It's really just the mod, which is the one that you need to uh, think about there because all the rest of them are pretty self-explanatory. I know I'm rushing, but this is quite straightforward, isn't it? 
All right, so let's get into the meat of this now and talk about variables, constant, global variables, inputs and outputs. And this again is pretty straightforward. We know that a variable is a, is a location in memory where a value can be stored. And that location can change as the program is running. And it's that as, that pro, as the program is running, which makes it different from a constant, where the value cannot change when the program is running. We use pi as the example, because pi is, well, it's pi. It doesn't change, does it? And I know people can know this to, to ridiculous lengths, that the pi, but 3.14. Let's use that. So one can change when the program's running and one can't. And of course, when you're doing your programming questions, just figuring out how you declare a variable can often get you one mark, <clears throat> even if you can't do anything else. So a global variable, the difference here is that that would apply across the, across the entire program. So if you've got sub-programs and modules and so on, you can make a global variable that works across over all of it and you're going to use that word global in front of declaring your variable. So that's all that you need to worry about there. OK, so then we've got input and we've got output. And that one piece of code there, my name equals input, uh, open brackets, um, inverted commas, please enter a name, that you are going to use in the exam. That's going to get you a mark somewhere when they will say, write a program which takes an input from the user. So learn that piece of code and if it says what well, they always have to take an input or it's going to be input equals you know so just make sure you learn that piece of code and then for the output you've got print um, and so th those two lines of code plus knowing variables and thinking about how to declare one and of course initialization which is setting a variable to uh, so x um, x equals zero you're creating a place in memory called x and you're saving the value zero in that place and initialization means that you're setting the value of that variable initially to zero so thinking about oh, i don't know health in a game or score in a game and it starts at zero all right so that's the uh, that's the key thing there all right where are we 42 bit of a recap here we've got sequence when we've got input indicate to user will input something output something output on the screen in fact, we've just done this. Input age equals input how old are you? And output can be print age. So that's easy peasy. And I guess the reason that sequence is there, that they include sequence in the exam, but sequence is really just the idea that the code, the programming code, computer code, starts at line one and then it runs through until the end. Unless you interrupt the flow of the program by using a construct like selection or like a while loop. And you've got selection iteration the two constructs that you need to understand which disrupt the flow of a program depending upon what happens and user inputs and so on when the program is running okay so that is the sequence idea there selection we looked at this last time um, and of course there are two flavors of selection which are uh, the if statement and then using switch case okay um, Switch case can be quite handy, and switch case is a more elegant way of solving problems when you've got multiple entries. It's just a bit of an easier one to use, really. So an if statement, you've got if entry is the same as A, then print A, else if, and so on. And don't forget, you've got as many else ifs as you need, and then you've got the else as the catch-all at the end, okay? So if a student gets over 80, give them a 9. If they get over 70, give them an 8, blah, 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 blah. And you end up getting down to 10. If they get less than 10, and that'll be your else, then they get unclassified because they basically spell their name right. Okay, so that's what you need to remember. And there was a mark in a recent past paper that you did where, the, where they actually wanted to see if you understood that there had to be that last catch-all, the else, the default, they called it. Um, there was a mark for that in the mark scheme. Right, so that is selection. Let's push on to the next one. 15 minutes left. Oh, good. The switch case one is here. Um, case A, do this. Case B, do that. And the default, that's the catch-all. That's the else equivalent. Um, and then look at this one, because just like you've got the if at the top, you've got the switch entry at the switch case, at the switch entry at the top, and you've got the end switch at the bottom. So those are like the two tags, if you think about HTML, that are, that are sort of starting and ending this particular construct, all right? So you've got the uh, switch entry and end switch there. And all you've got to do is figure out when to use these. I mean, quite often you can get away with using either iteration, um, 
in the in the, in the exam but don't forget you've got two flavors of those that we'll get onto now okay so you've got the while and the for and the do loop that's it on one page this is what you need to know for GCSE so you've got while the while loop is like this one input entry while input while entry is not the same as a then print end while you've got the for loop which is your count controlled loop and the while and the do are your condition controlled loop so the the for loop is going to repeat something a certain number of times and you would start with zero so if it's going to repeat five times you do for i and the i by the way they always use i because it's iteration it's the number of times that it happens so for i equals zero to five do this uh, print um then print uh, please enter a and then end for okay so that's all that you need to do and then you've got the do while loop which is do answer equals input until answer is the same as correct and the only difference between the while and the do loop is when the condition is checked is it checked at the start or is it checked at the end of the construct and that's it and quite often you can get away with using either of those the last couple of questions they just wanted to see that you recognize that you're going to use one of those loops okay so obviously a count controlled loop um, what's a uh, a do while well that's just the do while until but so okay that's a good question it is here and and here's the key thing right is that uh, here's the problem is that pseudocode isn't a real language um, Python it has to be this to work pseudocode as long as it's understandable then that's fine OCR have produced their own um, exam reference language and, and they've kind of taken what is generally used but the answer is that it, it, it's not a real code so they can't really say oh that that's that's incorrect because because you know you've got one bit of grammar differently or you've used a slightly different word or put it in a slightly different way it's kind of this is just generally what you need to use and though that's what they're going to be looking for i hope that helps because it's not it's not like python or or C sharp where it has to be this way or else it'll throw up an error this is so the idea is so a programmer could be given this and then they would know what to do with it afterwards I, I hope that sort of answers your question all right so now we get into 13 minutes not sure we'll have time for the quiz today string manipulation so this is where you've got a string which is obviously alphanumeric um, uh, characters and you can manipulate these strings. You can do things with them. And the word manipulate here is like in Photoshop. You can manipulate an image to make someone look uh, bigger or smaller or to, you know, to change the color of their hair. Oh, I would choose that example, wouldn't I? So let's, let's get into these. So first of all, you've got the length of a string. So if you want to find the length of a string, you would use LEN. Then you've got uppercase and lowercase. So you can change the string. So a sentence, you could change it into lowercase or uppercase. So you've got topic equals computer science. And if you did topic dot lower, it will then change it into lowercase. And if you do topic dot upper, you can change it into uppercase. I strongly recommend that you look at this in conjunction with the um, with the exam reference code that's in the specification. There's, a, I think, about eight pages there. And this sort of is about halfway through. And there are some examples in there that you can look at. So that's how you would simply take um, take a string, um, which in this case is topic, and by going topic lower, you can change the the string from uppercase to lowercase just using dot lower dot upper. It's not rocket science; it's computer science. Concatenation means to join strings together. So you know, I don't know whether, whether you've used Excel, where sometimes you've got uh, you've got uh, you've got an address and it breaks it up sometimes in a way that actually you've got the address running across four or five columns but you actually want to bring the whole thing together so it's kind of drawing things together and making it one block that's the idea of concatenation okay it's when you join different strings to form a sort of a larger string if you like so example would be print string a plus string b and that's what it's going to be it's going to just bring those two strings together i'm aware that i'm rushing but this actually, although some of this is new to you, it's actually quite simple to understand. All right, so now we're gonna look at uh, at substring, okay? <clears throat> and this is more about um, string manipulation. 
so subject we've got uh, a variable called subject and it's it's a string and it's computer science all right subject dot length gives the value of 15. I'm assuming you're ahead of me now and that you've counted C O M P U T E R S C I E N C E 15. I haven't got 15 fingers I just realized that so but do you get it so subject dot length will give the value 15. It's quite easy isn't it? So subject dot substring three point uh, three comma five returns pewter. What's that one doing? Subject dot substring. So we've got subject, which is our variable, and we know that inside the box called subject, the place in memory called subject, we've got a string which is computer science. So what does subject dot substring three comma five? What does that produce? Yeah, spot on. And actually, you know what? It, it works so much better when you see it in this way. That's exactly what it does. Well done, Aditya. It starts at position three and it goes five places, right? P U T E R. Okay, nice and easy. Are we happy with that? Um, and then we've got subject dot left four returns comp. What does that one do? And have a look at the last one too. Subject dot write three returns oops. Yeah, absolutely spot on, man like Paul. What a good man you are. Um, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Well, I'm saying that it's pretty straightforward when someone shows it to you. Yeah, and then we've got so that's good, man like Paul Aditya. The first one is a computer science. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I know that you get it. Okay, so you can see what is happening here. So just remember the difference, right, between um, the uh, three comma five and what's that and what that has done is that it's gone to position three which is c-o-m-p and then it's returned um it's returned five after that okay it's it's returned the next five characters after that in 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 the string and subject so subject left and subject right i'm sure you get this okay so this is that part of string manipulation which is really quite easy but again, find a way of making sure that you can remember this um, if they ask you to do it in the exam. So typically speaking, they might ask you to do something like uh, write a program that will open this, open this text file, will pull out the value, a certain number of letters, will then save it, and will then close it, okay? So now we're into, uh, did I go too far? No, that's right, okay, brilliant. Okay, so now we're into random number generation and this would work this way num equals random first number comma last number so that's the sort of the pseudo code for it is that num equals random open brackets one comma ten will generate and return a random number between one and ten but you can see this is just like learning a new language isn't it well, literally so num equals random one comma ten it will just give you a random number between one and ten so it's that it's that one comma ten in brackets that does it all good so that's the random number generator it's true isn't it is that when you go through it at, at this pace you go well yeah that is it it's actually really quite 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 straightforward you would wouldn't you you would think there's a lot more to it than that but computer code has to be quite simple to understand but don't forget it, it is that it's always going to be more to it than just creating a random number. You'll create a random number and then do something else with it, okay? But when you break it down, and of course, don't forget, that's why in this course we've got this whole big focus on uh, decomposition and abstraction. So when you're in the exam, it won't just say create a random number. This will be a sort of sub part of the problem. But then you'll have inside your head, okay, I can do that bit. And literally just plan it out step by step by step. And don't forget the bullet points, one, two, three, four, are usually the things you've got to do. And there might be two things in one bullet point, and that's how they get to their six marks. It's, uh, it really isn't that bad. All right, arrays. We know that an array is a list, and a list enables you to store multiple items of data. An array is just a computer term for list, okay? It includes an index. Now, the index refers to the position of items within that array. So if we think about... Um, Remember the work we did on sorts and search? You'd have your numbers sort of underneath, and you've got position zero, position one, position two, position three. And 
the position zero is why we have that minus one because position zero is the first position right so rules about an array is that a the lists b they have an index and c data in the array must be the same data type so you can't go mixing up characters with integers and real it just doesn't work so you've got the data's got to be of the same type so everywhere we looked at the sort of the different types of data right it's, it's got to be the same or else it ain't going to work so let's looking at declaring an array when you're creating an array so you say the name of the array and the number of items so the example we've got here is that array colors square brackets five creates an array which is called colors with five elements in it so far so good um, the length of an array now I've learned I need to go this way there we go the length of an array uh, can be calculated using uh, array underscore name dot length so remember we looked at the um, how you'd calculate the length of a string a minute ago so that's exactly the same principle except we're doing it with an array and those are the two ways that you can do it so array underscore name dot length or len open score and then the array name in brackets and that's it so you might do really well to run through this once I've done I'm never gonna get this done in time and to actually um, and to actually create a crib sheet of these little items that you've got to learn and then just sit there and chug through them use a mind palace to try to create these right a 2d array this is it, so the first array we look like we looked at is literally a line of items dog cat house table a 2d array can store multiple items and this is more like an Excel spreadsheet where you've got sort of columns and you've got rows okay um, multiple arrays of data um, and it's an array of arrays if you like and it includes an index for the main array and that refers to the position of each array in the main array so it's 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 arrays within arrays again data has got to be of the same type um, and the way that you would declare it is exactly the same is you say array colors five comma six and that gives you wrong way and that gives you five rows and six columns so can you see how that can be used in a database or a spreadsheet so you're going to say we've got five rows and six columns so again within square brackets um, it's just two numbers and that's going to be how many rows how many columns okay you go along and then you go up you go along the corridor and up the stairs so that is your rows and columns there I'm going to shift it what is it 57 um, SQL structured query language okay we looked at this earlier the way of mitigating against this would be question mark answers in the comments please uh, data is normally stay stored in a database I don't think you need Sherlock Holmes to tell you that <laughs> so data will be stored as a record so you've got all the different pieces of data which are stored as a record so in my driving license it would have um, or on my passport it would it would it would have my name it would have my age it would have other details about me so that's all stored together like in your library card okay um, and it uses a programming language called SQL which we know is structured query language um, and you you need to learn a couple of the commands to actually a couple of SQL commands so that you can manipulate things inside databases so this is very much the same thing okay I, th I think this is even easier to be honest with you so you've got the following commands and this is it select from and where right what you're gonna get uh, encryption is a way of mitigating an SQL attack Oh, Bogdan I would like um, Oh, Bogdan, that reminds me. I need to speak to me tomorrow about these um, algorithms because the format that I've got isn't what I thought I had, but, but, but I do have them. Um, encryption is not what we'd use there. Think about data going into a database because an, an SQL attack is when you include SQL um, code that's designed to... Uh, ooh, Emad, Emad has struck like a ninja warrior. It is data validation, absolutely correct. It's making sure the data that goes into the database is is not some kind of malicious SQL code designed to either gain unauthorized access or gain access at a higher level. Okay, all right. I've lived I've lived the day to see Bogdan make a mistake, so I can retire happy now. Um, 
Okay, select from and where. So for example, select age, comma, address, um, attributes, or star to select all. So, so you've, got, you've got different things going on here. So you're gonna say select the age um, and address um, from student, which is the name of the table, That's all right. Do you know what, though? I'm actually pleased because I've had the impression all the way through that you've known everything that I'm doing. So the fact that there's something useful for you here, this makes the whole thing worthwhile, doesn't it? This is what it's about. Um, it's seven o'clock, guys. It's seven o'clock. And I actually think that I will probably, because I think that I've got as far as I could reasonably get in this time. And I've still got a lot to do. So what I'll do is, I will actually start with SQL next time because I don't think that I've done this justice, all right? And I will start with SQL next time and I will finish this because I've still got, I'm only halfway through what I need to do. Um, Miss Silver said to me, you've got no hope of getting through this in half an hour. And I went, oh, I can definitely do that. So I'll tell you what I'll do because half an hour is half an hour and I'm not going to carry on because that's not part of the deal. So what I will do is I will shuffle things and I will carry on from SQL next week because um, I think this is worth taking time over. All right, so listen, and I'm sorry we haven't had time for a quiz today. Um, I haven't, I haven't actually. I actually ended up buying the app because I was too impatient waiting for one uh, every day to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I might have to go ha have a go at it after this. So listen guys, I'm gonna say goodbye to you. Um, we will c carry on with, um, with uh, SQ from SQL next week. We'll have a look at a few examples because I think um, we've run out of time. So listen, it's 7.01. Have a lovely week and I'll see you in seven days. Bye bye.